What's up and welcome back to Nostalgia Pod, quarantine edition number 8-9. Oh, we're starting to get out of it. Oh, things are opening, Dave. Uh, and we're still giving you that weekly look at what's going on in pop culture. My name is Pat Sheehan, joined, as I alluded to, by my trusty co-host, Dave Martin Swagger, who just went viral. Dave, how you doing, man? Shout out Shrek 2, the superior Shrek film. I did have someone in the mentions telling me they thought Shrek 3 was the best, and that no, person is dumb. <laughs> I I don't even really remember Shrek 2. I don't know if I was a big fan of it, but Shrek 1, thanks. And the scene that you picked out, one of the best, for sure. Uh, follow Dave at Martin Swagger for all that juicy, juicy viral content. Dave, we got quite a few things to get to this week, a couple albums, a couple TV shows, and a pretty good movie. So we, we got a lot to talk about. So hit that subscribe button if you're on youtube.com slash nostalgia pod. Go to soundcloud.com slash nostalgia pod to consume the podcast in your earballs any way you want to. And also go to iTunes and give us a five star rating and review if you don't mind. Dave, let's start in Brooklyn, New York, which talking about your tweets, you shouted out for having a hell of a rap year this year, Brooklyn. Yeah, uh, we, we've been frequenting Brooklyn uh, quite quite often, and we haven't even reviewed everything. But uh, I don't think it can be overstated. Pop Smoke, Two Two Gs, Chef G, C J Fly, Young M A, Smooth L, Sleepy Hollow, Flatbush Zombies. It's a quite a prolific year. Really putting the Bronx to shame because we did not fuck with Little T J. <laughs> or a boogie. So, pretty funny. Uh, but yeah, once again, we're back at it with another uh, up-and-coming young rapper from Brooklyn. Flatbush, the uh, the focal point, the, the capital of Brooklyn, as Chef G puts it. And that'd be Chef G's friend, Sleepy Hollow, with his second mixtape slash album, Sleepy Hollow Presents Sleepy for President. So, just off the bat, had you heard of Sleepy Hollow? Because he does have a bit of a hit right now, which would be the... Uh, uh, deep end freestyle it's it's a tiktok song at the moment yeah no i i did not know who this person was um you know i'm i'm not as up into the the up and coming rapidy rappers as you are um however i also have been tuned out from tiktok recently so that might mm-hmm. be why i've been unaware of him but you know deep end freestyle and listening to the album definitely one of the songs that jumps out so i'm not surprised to hear that he's blown up um have you been a fan? Because we didn't review "Don't Sleep" from last year. We did not. No, I hadn't. I didn't listen to it until this year. But it, it, I do. I do like "Don't Sleep." The song uh, "Too Fake" in particular, I think, is just a straight up banger. That song's great. But "Deep End Freestyle" came out just a few months ago and already became a TikTok song. It's a, you know, it's a "My Body Different" is is the drop that people use on TikTok, and uh, that's, that's that's pretty cool, but also kind of unexpected because like he's been featured on. Tons of Chef G songs, including the last project, which we talked about, but not famous. And I'm just curious, how the hell did this song blow up on TikTok? Just because it's really coming from a nobody. And I think that's just how TikTok works is it just it really can blow anyone up, you know. Mm-hmm. But in this case, you know, I think Sippy Hall is already someone who was building a following. And, you know, again, due to his uh, association with Chef G, who's probably at the top right now when it comes to this broken drill scene. Uh, that's, you know speaks or something so i mean what did you think though of this the second project of this pretty yeah, quick yeah. a lot of songs they're mostly short yeah i appreciated the, the the short songs quick listen only about 28 minutes um i thought this was pretty good i didn't think it stood out as like a amazing album especially as you mentioned we reviewed a lot of really strong albums from brooklyn this year but it had some really great moments in my book um i found myself going back again listening to a couple of the songs right after hearing them um you you mentioned deep end freestyle and i thought that one was great bmh i really liked a lot and then one of the the other songs that stood out was anxiety freestyle i thought was a really strong song at the back uh, half the album a lot of the other ones i found kind of unremarkable but overall just really solid and I, i i could see him being um similar to uh, I think some of the other up and coming Brooklyn people we've been talking about kind of just being in the scene for a while and, you know, continuing to grow and, and, and get fame. I can't imagine he's up for XSL freshman, but he, if he was, he'd be in the discussion. I have to say he's pretty, 
he's up there. Right. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Um, and I, I, going over Brooklyn just just now, I forgot Five Year Foreign, who yeah. <laughs> who was also on this album. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I liked a lot of the Chef G tracks. They have a it's really a, ri- a rich a rich history together as childhood friends. And uh, when Chef G came out of jail and they released uh, uh, Panic Part Two, that was like the comeback Chef G song featuring Sleepy Hollow. And of course, we have another song in the Panic series on this. Uh, I agree. BMH, I thought was was definitely a highlight. I thought he had some funny wordplay on that. Like, like, get popped like a perk or something. Shorty want to top like a shirt or something. Uh, I thought that was funny. Uh, but for me, I think the highlight was Bad Luck. Bad Luck kind of hmm. like, blew me away just because I wasn't expecting something like that from him where it's a more subdued delivery and really dark and really sad. Not uncharacteristic of a lot of drill music given uh, what we expect from that traditional produ- production but I think the lyricism really stood out to me um, you know, talking about cops shooting black guys and him just struggling to stay alive in the hood and stuff like that so yeah I think Sleepy Hollow is definitely a lot bigger and uh, has more going on than just a TikTok viral hit so this is I think an- another confirmation of that from people that maybe didn't hear the project last year so Sleepy Hollow like most Brooklyn rappers, is good. Yeah, and Bad Luck, a timely song for, I think, the, the current atmosphere. And we're, we'll be talking a little bit more about a timely album, I think, in terms of the current atmosphere. But let's stay in Brooklyn um, and, and jump right to the Sleepy Hollow's rap group, Flatbush Zombies, mm-hmm. who we, we talked about a little bit last year when we were um, reviewing the uh, Escape from New York album. Uh, the Beast Coast, Joey Badass, uh, I guess just like that all New York scene team up. Mm-hmm. And then two years ago with Vacation from Hell, which I think we both really liked. And just um, I think what we appreciate most about Flatbush Zombies is just that their their production, their beats, their style, that like trippy rap hip hop sound is so unique. And I think just kind of engages you a little bit more than the, the traditional and, and the what you would normally be listening to. It's just it's so different. Did that continue on uh, now more than ever, their latest EP for you? Yeah, interesting. Uh, I would say this is definitely a much more subdued record mm-hmm. from them. Once again, all the beats, I think, are still strong. Eric, Ar- Eric the Architect, one of, one of the trio, produced everything or co-produced everything. We also got Tyler Dops on the boards here, who was also on the Beast Coast album. So it doesn't sound sound uh, unlike their past stuff, but I think the the performances from the guys is just more subdued and less um, erratic. And once you listen a little deeper, then that makes sense because this was something that's kind of was designed to speak to like coronavirus and just like you know changing uh, norms for everyone going on, obviously. And uh, now it's kind of serving a double meeting because they released a merch drop for this ep when and we're donating all the proceeds to black lives matter charities they said they would get a hundred thousand dollars if they sold all every piece of the merch and they did that in like an hour or something because they have <laughs> such a loyal fan base so yeah there's, there's kind of like a lot of, they, they put a lot of writing on this because it's just like you know kind of a holdover ep they said they're working on an album but uh I still liked it, but it's definitely different. This is not like Thug Waffle Flatbush Zombies. This isn't, you know, bath salts or anything. It's 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 a little quieter, I guess. Yeah, it definitely was a little bit more subdued, but I, just, I still think the beats are really strong. And I think you get a little bit of that, that trippy production on a couple of the songs, like Herb, especially the first track, I thought still had a lot of that, that Flatbush Zombie sound to it, even if it was a little bit more toned down. Um, and I thought Herb into I Am Legend. Um was just a really strong one to start to this. And then uh, I also really like Blessings near the end. I I think when um, I think when they are just kind of trading bars, going back and forth like they do on Herb and, and you have Meech kind of jump in with that deep voice and just kind of like bring it home on Herb and then start off I Am Legend, it just really meshes together so well. And that's when I feel like they really just pop up, you know, uh, out of the, the phone for me as I'm listening to it. Any songs on here that you found particularly strong or you were vibing? I really like dirty elevator music that has kind of notable ear catching keys 
particular from the production side. And thought Meech also gave a really nice performance on that song. Also on the last track, When I'm Gone, get from Meech, R.I.P. to Mac Millie. Of course, Mac Miller, like to hear that, even though they never actually collaborated. They were still obviously in the same circles. And actually, you think back, Joey Badass's debut official feature is on the Mac Miller song, America. And in that mm. video, two of the Flatbush Zombies are in there, even though they're not on that song. So kind of a cool uh, uh, circle completion, I guess. But I, yeah, I liked Herb as well. I thought Herb sounded really cool. Juice. I think Juice is probably one of the guys who, when he's more subdued, it stands out because that's just usually not what he does. Um, but I really liked him on that song, nonetheless. So yeah, this is cool because it's, it's quite different. You know, I guess in a sense, it continues what we heard on uh, Escape from New York with the Beast Coast album because on the Beast Coast album, there's a lot of experimenting from a lot of the guys. You know, mm-hmm. usually that was more to like reggae and like uh, more island sounds. Yeah. But uh, hearing this once again, they're just. I think a really, really talented group. They're completely independent. So they, they really just do whatever they want. And I remember Meech tweeted probably a few months back now before quarantine that they were working with James Blake. Oh, shit. And everyone's <laughs> kind of hoping and you know, that's going to be something cool. Maybe yeah. I'll be on the next album. Who knows? But uh, either way, Flatbush Zombies. I mean, if you know, you know at this point. I feel like a lot of times we'll be talking about an album and be like, ah, oh, what if they work with this person next time or they try this? That's like one of those team ups that maybe we would like throw out there that would we can only hope could happen that's that's mm-hmm. perfect in my mind so looking forward to hearing more from them um why don't we move on though to uh an album that garnered a lot of attention dropped a couple of days early run the jewels four r2j4 dropped on wednesday june 3rd amidst the uh protests uh violence um against people in the black and African-American community um, and uh, dropping as killer Mike said, because tomorrow is not promised. So dropping it early, um, I think feels very much like a run the jewels album, which is good. You know, that they, they, I think with all four of these albums, you could have taken a couple songs out, put them in there and it would have all felt the same, which I think is, is good and bad in some ways. Maybe we'll talk about that. But overall, I was really blown away because I think this album is not only as strong lyrically and sonically as any other of the R2J albums, but it just feels so of the moment, which is also unfortunate because I think uh, I think if, if maybe people had been paying attention a little bit more or been a little bit more called to be taking action, any RTJ album would have felt of the moment, you know, because this isn't a new issue and new new themes that they're speaking to on here. But with the uh, the recent upswell and, and people wanting to take action against police brutality, it felt very timely. Dave, how, how are you feeling about RTJ4? What were just your general thoughts on it? Yeah, I was very excited when it dropped early, just threw the threw the headphones on for this one, you know, just really locked in. And it's it's kinda of, sometimes they make like run through the wall music, especially if you're connecting to the greater message. And it's always funny because run the jewels in general, they're not a duo to concoct these really deep roundabout metaphors. They're usually really uh blunt and upfront about what they're saying. A lot of times that can just be like stupid jokes or really aggressive anti-establishment mm-hmm. uh, sentiments, obviously. And for RTJ4, I think, uh, like you said, they're giving you exactly what you expect, but it's coming at literally exactly the right time. It was it, This was the two days early, but it was basically the scheduled release date. And yet it's like just what the doctor ordered, which is funny because we were saying something similar about Charlie XCX, which was a... a like an album for the moment when it came yeah. to quarantine and now we have an album for the moment when it comes to uh social unrest in in the in the u.s and the, the larger world so uh yeah it, it it's tough to say it's overstate just it's 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 exactly what we needed and 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 it's great yeah it's it's a really strong album and i, I think the verse everybody's been talking about is killer mike on walking in the snow um you actually put it on your story the other day. Um, and really, it's uh, it's a handful of lines in the middle. I'll pull it up and just kind of read them off because I think it really speaks to the moment. Um, but uh, the interesting <clears throat> thing about these lyrics, right, is that 
Um, they could have been written two days before this dropped. They could have been written a week before this dropped, but they were written back in September. Um, and every day on the evening news, they feed you fear for free. And you so numb, you watch the cops choke out a man like me until my voice goes from a shriek to whisper, I can't breathe. And you sit there in the house on the couch and watch it on TV. Um, yeah. And Killer Mike wrote this, this verse uh, about Eric Gardner, the Eric Gardner mm-hmm. killing. Um, and to have the killing of the, the murder of George Floyd uh, at the hands of the Minneapolis police be so similar in circumstance the way it came about um the way that they did murder him uh and for that to be kind of the rallying cry right now around these protests just feels like one of those like serendipitous moments where you're just kind of like how is this even i mean (laughs) you say how is this even possible well we know what it is it's systemic racism within the uh law enforcement uh across the united states but it just feels like really uh almost like there's like a higher power at play with, with something like that to be coming out this time. I, I know hearing that verse, I was completely blown away. Um, and that's not even to just speak to walking in the snow as a larger song, which I think is just a complete banger of a song. Uh, great chorus LP. I think on the first verse kills it. Any thoughts on that song? Anything that stood out to you particularly? Uh, no, I guess not. Um, I think in general, all the RTG, RTJ albums, nothing ever like comes out of left field. They always kind of, everything just kind of feels like of a piece. And like you said, you can still cut songs or pie songs you don't want to hear again, just, you know, ignore. And I think when RTJ is at their quote worst, it's just because they make music that sometimes is just a little dense, you know, like mm-hmm. the way they rap combined with that production. You can't throw these songs on all the time. Yeah. You know, you have to kind of be in the mood, obviously. Like, and some some exceptions or like legend has it or mm-hmm. close your eyes count the fuck stuff like that but yeah in general it's like you got to be in the mood for it so but uh yeah i, I didn't think anything like 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 blew me away it was just kind of more of what they do but i guess more focused and uh, unfortunately still very prescient yeah yeah i i agree i you know kind of going through the songs that you could take out I, what were the songs that you feel like were essential to this album or kind of define this album for you I really like Never Look Back. Mm-hmm. Uh, interesting, like, synths on there. You don't get a lot of synths from LP. So that no. was cool. Uh, Just is a cool one because look at all those slave masters. Was it posing, dancing on your dollar, however it goes? Um, a friend of the show, Mike Lennon, pointed out to me that that's just as strong of a political statement and slogan as it is a hook for a song. And kind of an interesting combo of skateboard p and zach de la roca on the same track uh pharrell i don't know if pharrell really adds anything super great to the song but it's kind of cool to hear his energy i guess and it's always great to hear from zach period so yeah. rtj seems to just bring him out and of course in a certain sense run the jewels is an extension of rage against the machine there they're really interested in the same stuff so uh, that's great um Two chains was kind of unexpected for me out of sight <laughs> in the beginning, but he sounded great on the track. So yeah, I was with he that did. one. He also, I think, uh, outside of Killer Mike, had the line of the album. I bought a hot dog stand. I'm trying to be frank. I, <laughs> I, I literally two chains. Uh, every time he pops up, always has yep. one line that just makes me fucking laugh out loud. So good. I, I appreciate two chains for that. Um, yeah, it, to go back just for a second onto. Uh, just with or just money with with zach uh on the track it's so interesting because i you know i found myself listening to rage against the machine quite a lot this week i think you know that's kind of the mindset i was in was kind of like fuck the establishment (laughs) and uh i i just kind of want to hear zach jump on a whole album with r2j or just do like more remix with them because he just fits in so well with their vibe and it seems like he brings it every time he gets on a song with them. Um, I wonder if he just doesn't want to do more. Uh, I, I don't. I don't really know if he's doing like his own indie music that I'm just not tuned into. He's not. Uh, not really. No. But, R- but Rage was going to have that comeback tour this year that uh, yeah. got at least postponed, if not flipped on its head due to the pandemic, of course. Yeah, that's true. So I don't. I don't know. But um, yeah, sorry, I cut you off. Any other songs that you really been digging on this? Uh, I felt holy camel fuck. 
was yeah. was also strong. Mike's just really good on that. In general, I think Mike makes a bigger impression on this album than LP rapping wise, mm-hmm. but LP's still just fitting in and out when he can. He still has great chemistry with Mike, so yeah. it always works. But it felt like uh, Mike's voice was just a little louder this time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, heck, they they've been creative partners for like eight years at this point, so that, that's to be expected. Yeah, uh, I I I wanted to shout out uh, Queens of the Stone Age, Josh Hum. Jumping on, uh, pulling the pin. Um, just, a, I thought that was an interesting addition to an RTJ album. And, uh, I actually really liked the last song a lot. I felt like the production on that was, um, some of LP's best on the record. And there are a couple other producers on that one Sweeney, Ripple, Shalamar, Wilder, Zobie. So, um, it obviously wasn't all him, but I thought kind of incorporating the strings kind of brought that. I thought it was a great closer for the album. And then having that like drop in the beat and then it just kind of like comes rushing back in. Killer Mike gives one last great verse on it. Great way to wrap it up. I want, there was a tweet from a, uh, a, a, a RTJ fan, but uh, I think also he's a uh, bit of like a music critic or at least a influencer in some respect. J- Jensen Carp. He said, just an FYI. Run the Jewels has the greatest four album run in hip hop history. Dave, do you agree with this statement? Yeah, think about that a little bit. First comes to mind would be someone like Tupac, who had a very prolific career. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting. Now, I mean, I was thinking, you know, it's like RTJ, much like Freddie Gibbs, who we discussed last week, is one of the truly bangable, consistent things in rap. You mm-hmm. just are always going to get something really good every time. Um, four album runs i gotta think a little deeper yeah um there was one actually a group that came to mind immediately for me that's outcast you know going atlians aquamini synconia and speaker box the love below sure which went i think like triple platinum or diamond or something like that yeah uh, that's, that's a diamond record back when that meant something yeah yeah um <laughs> that, that's that's the first one that came to mind for me well that's also funny because of course killer mike's whole come up in early career is in direct association with Goody Mob and Outcast. So, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Uh, I, I couldn't really think of any others off the rip. I mean, I think go Kanye, but you have it, either any way you slice it, you have 808 in the middle and pe- some people ride for that. I don't necessarily ride for 808 that much. Right. No, it's not a universally like to say yeah. that. No. Eminem is another one. You have like the first three and then you yeah. have encore as the fourth one, which is, isn't good enough. Um, Actually, wait, no. Hold on. Infinite. My name is Marshall Mathers LP Eminem Show. Infinite's strong. probably not strong enough to do it, but that's close. Um, yeah, I'd say Tupac's probably the closest. Yeah. Um, well, what is your preferred RTJ album? Do you have one? Yeah, two. I think two's the best. I had that yeah. on my decade albums list. Um, that was like the level up to the level up. Really dis. Really, in terms of like congruous albums, that's the one I think they're, they're just most like focused on mm-hmm. what they're I doing agree. on the album. That's my favorite. I agree, but I think this one might be might be number two for me. Um, uh, I just uh, I like how they incorporated guitars a lot on this. It almost mm. so this almost feels like a, a album that they could really do with a live band and just really crush it. Um, I'd like to see how they do this live. So whenever we can tour and go to shows again, I definitely want to catch them. Uh, probably in Brooklyn and maybe some of the rappers, but let's talk about some TV now. Let's transition, transition to Space Force, the Netflix. <laughs> I see you shaking your head. The Netflix comedy starring Steve Carell and a whole slew. Uh, this ensemble cast, I guess John Malkovich would be like the co-lead in this in a way. Um, but yeah, this, this cast is deep. And I think when, Space Force was first announced. People thought it's a good idea, good premise. You got Steve Carell at the helm. Probably a lot of potential for this, this to go well. Well, similar to the actual Space Force date, was this a, a success or a total disaster? It's hard to call it a comedy when it's just not funny, dude. Yeah. Uh, no, nah, this, this is really flat, man. And upon learning more about the show, that this, the genesis of this was more just concept and idea that Netflix presented mm-hmm. uh, than anything else. Not that that's always a bad thing. Lost had the same <laughs> origin, but it's it just didn't come together. Yeah. And at the end of the day, 
it's not very funny. It's not witty. It's not that intelligent. It has a main protagonist that is difficult to root for most of the time, especially in the beginning of the season. Oh, yeah. There's just not a lot to latch on to. And it's, you know, I don't care how much it's in the top 10 of Netflix. It's just, uh, it's not, it's not good. At least his first season is not good. It reminds me a lot of how Avenue 5 really fell flat for HBO earlier in the year. Um, and a similar thing where you, you had this really great high concept in, in Space Force's case. Uh, it's not actually a satire on the Space Force or our political climate, despite the fact that we're going to parody people like AOC and Nancy Pelosi and stuff. It's just a workplace comedy, except it's not a funny or smart one. And it wastes a lot of that great cast you're mentioning. So, yeah, this was, uh, I mean, it's only five hours long, the first season, but it's it was, it was just kind of a chore to finish. And I, I think I think it ends stronger than it starts, but uh, it's a little bar. Yeah, I agree with most of what you said. I think... I think probably the the first sign for me that this was not not hidden was that pretty much every time I saw someone on the screen, I just wanted to watch something else that they're in, uh, whether it was uh, seeing Steve Carell try to deliver some of these jokes that for the most part were pretty poorly written. Um, I just kind of wanted to see Michael Scott. Um, you know, when uh, Ben Schwartz would pop up, I wanted to watch uh parks and rec <laughs> you know like i wanted Sonic. yeah jimmy o yang i just wanted to go back and watch early uh silicon valley like there there were some there were some moments i thought really worked like ben Sh- and, and all these people i think individually have some funny moments like i think ben schwartz as the publicist is probably my favorite character him and jimmy o yang yeah <laughs> um and and malkovich i also think yeah um, i think he was the best of uh, Episode, episode, probably. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, especially because the last time we watched Malkovich, I think we both were a little bit turned off by his performance in The New Pope. Um, but yeah, I just felt, I just felt like a lot of these parts, a lot of these plot lines just resolved too quickly, just kind of fell through. Like, it's, and especially with, um, his daughter, was it, uh, mm-hmm. Diana Silvers, who, we know from book smart last year plays like the hot cool girl in that um was playing aaron uh steve carell's daughter i felt like the decisions the everything with her was just like half big she's dating this russian guy and then all of a sudden that's just over she's kind of like trying to date like the only running through line of this whole thing was that she wanted to spend more time with her dad and dad wasn't around um but yeah, so much of the stuff with her, I feel like, was like half ideas that just kind of fall through, not actually written out. And she's such a charismatic actor that to not give her more to do and just kind of be this like display of how bad of a person or how overwhelmed Steve Carell's Mark Naird is, is just such a waste. And mm-hmm. that, it's kind of the whole season, just such a waste. Right. And the plot of the show, it's, there's not. <clears throat> Not a whole lot of over, overwhelming conflict on the Space Force angle of it, um, in terms of like the Russians or the Chinese or whatever. Like nothing really amounts to whole much conflict. And then the stuff with like the rivalry with the Air Force where Noah Emmerich going really over the top, that, that also comes and goes. Mm-hmm. So you're left with this whole other, whole other plots regarding Naird's personal life. And like you said, it just really service level stuff. Like you have Lisa Kudrow kind of <sighs> over, uh, uh, cast in it's not quite a nothing part i'd say but like because we, we get more like the talk about monogamy later in the season i guess but it's like i don't think anything like comes to this amazing end point that there's not like any great moments that land like that you know and i think for me the stuff i'm in especially in the early goings man where Nair is just really arrogant and mm-hmm. unintelligent about stuff that you don't really care that his personal life is bad because you already really don't like everything else you're being shown of him already, right? Mm-hmm. So I guess for me, like this, I, I like like moments like like when they're fighting during the test exercise with like the BB guns or the, the airsoft guns, whatever they were, right? Yeah. Against the Air Force, that was kind of funny. Mm-hmm. I think episode six where uh, Caitlin Olsen and Gina Kavankar cameo or guest star, mm-hmm. the one episode where Olsen's like the Theranos 
lady yeah. is the spoof. Like that, that that was funny. But like there, there was just no like consistent arc for me. And it's kind of weird because Carell and Greg Daniels are the creative forces behind the show. And of course, they, they, they're the same for The Office. And, and The Office had a um, had to recalculate after its first season. You think they would have learned that lesson, but again, similar to Avenue Five with Iannucci and Veep, uh, I think some recalibration for a second season is in order because uh, this was just uh, it, it, it just wasn't that great. Steve Carell, interesting actor. Uh, I feel like he's taken a lot of L's recently. I want to pull up his filmography here real quick. He's done a lot of dramatic roles post Office, right? He wanted to branch out this is a this is probably his first major return to comedy um definitely on the tv side but you yeah know, stuff I mean, like beautiful see. boy and fox catcher mm-hmm. so it's a lot different than this right yeah i mean i guess he was in the big short yep. which I'd, I'd call a w for him fox catcher he got he got a nomination i believe for that so that's i don't think he did ruffalo did i no. think um okay so one of them did but um, let's see. Uh, obviously, he's the voice of Gru, which is probably is just big money cash cow at this point. Yep. Film wise, I mean, like he's in Vice boy. a little bit. That's right. Yeah, that's right. He he was good as Rumsfeld. I'll give that him was that. funny. Yeah, he gets that. Oh, Marwin, that's the yeah. Big owl. I was about to say, welcome to Marwin. That's the big owl. I mean, oh, that's really tough. Let's see. What where do we where do we got? Yeah, Space Force, The Morning Show, which has been pretty widely panned, and he's playing a Matt Lauer type. Figure, oh, that's I'm right. Not sure why he that. signed up for that? Um, let's see. And then, yeah, he hasn't done a lot of TV, honestly. Um, the yeah, the uh, before before the morning show, it looks like he really was only doing like one-offs. And then mm-hmm. Angie Tribeca, which I'm not really sure what that is, but looks like he was just a co-producer on that. Yeah. So yeah, this is, this is a really like his first return to comedy on tv and it's tough man i got it's hard though when, when you play a character like michael scott who really is so iconic and so just like a part of the the i don't know culture at this point mm-hmm. i mean and you can't go on twitter without seeing a michael scott meme um it, it just makes it hard i think for him to really branch out and i, I think Especially when he plays comedy, he he really just embodied that character so much, and it kind of just became him. That even in this role, I think you see a lot of of Michael Scott type uh, mannerisms and stupidity, but like then strangely competent at times. It's I don't know. It's it, I was really disappointed, um, but I do think there's some seeds, and, and I think if they sharpen up the writing a little bit and actually pick a consistent arc, we'll see some progress in season two, which it seems like there's going to be because it was left off on a cliffhanger. So uh, there will be a space for season two. And we'll be talking about it. Any last thoughts for you, Dave? I think my overall favorite aspect of the show would be the kind of burgeoning chemistry between Jimmy O. Yang and Tony Newsom's characters towards yeah. the back half of the season. Um, also nice to hear Jimmy O. Yang just be an actor and not have to do kind of a stereotypical Asian accent. He had yep. to do in Silicon Valley. So, you know, I just I like watching him and Tony Newsom. I'm, I'm newer too, but I thought you were also pretty good. So that's where I'm most uh, hopeful for. I feel like John Malkovich feels like a guy who's not going to hang around on TV that long. So I wonder if his Adrian Mallory character will leave. But either way, I don't know if was there actually an official renewal for season two yet. Um, I did not see anything. Uh, but I, I it's been so popular. I, I'm not worried about that. I'm sure it's going to come back. Yeah, and to leave it off the way they did, I just imagine that they're planning on season two. But yeah, I didn't see a, an official thing in any way. Also, R.I.P. Fred Willard. This might be the last thing we really see him. Yeah. In. So, um, I, I wish it was. I wish it was better for him. But let's move on to some TV shows that definitely are better than Space Force. I May Destroy You premiered last night on HBO. The Michaela Cole directed created series um and starring her which uh, i think the last time we really spoke about michaela cole was probably uh black earth rising mm-hmm. from uh netflix uh looking at the um the gen- a genocide in africa was it the rwandan genocide it was yep. yeah so that came out early 2019 so uh go check our review on that we had some thoughts i think overall we we felt like there were some good aspects but didn't really 
I think I think we thought it was a bit confusing. It wasn't really like written super well. Squandered potential, I'd say. Yeah, but Michaela Cole, I think, always kind of stood out as someone who we were keeping our eye on to see her really get this opportunity to shine in, in this thirty minute. Was this a drama comedy type thing? Like it's, t- it's tough to tell from the first episode because you know it, it ends with some really tough themes. But up until then, it's it kind of just reminded me of like Insecure or something, where it's just kind of like a goofy, right? show set in london and that's the thing reading a lot of the reviews which of course i've seen more of the show it's a 12 episode series so we'll, we'll this will take us through august but reading a lot of those reviews they're all harping on where we end in that pilot and it's funny that if you just go off the pilot you might not understand where the show is going but it's a you know i think it's been marketed as like a like a uh unorthodox view at consent when it comes to sex and stuff like that. And I think we're going to get where the, where the show's going to take us in terms of uh, Cole's character, Arabella kind of realizing that she was raped on that night in the first episode and coming to grips with that and, and the actions to follow throughout the season. So you almost, like you said, don't really get that vibe early on. And I think that the way this show is going to handle tone Seems to be a lot of the source of a lot of the praise. We're handling heavy themes, themes that Cole, uh, are personal to her. She uh, has it talked about being being assaulted as well. So, you know, she's bringing this into her work, which obviously she she wrote wrote the whole show. So, I think off the first episode, you're right. You kind of get that insecure vibe. There's these friends. There's these other characters. There's these work stressors, right? Mm-hmm. And she's like a famous famous author. Uh, yeah. a, a one hit one hit book anyway right and all well, that's all familiar but i think we're really going to get into like some some deeper heavy stuff and that is pretty exciting because of uh i think the the talent everyone has seen in cole as a creator so um yes yeah, so far i think it's it's the tone and i'm just curious to see how we're going to see this tone uh handle some obviously really challenging stuff yeah and i i think the speaking to the tone the tone of the first episode for the at least the first like 27 minutes of it or so is really just uh introducing you to arabella as this a bit eccentric writer you know kind of doing her own thing very of the very much like a product of this modern generation where she's obviously like addicted to her phone and uh you know she travels to italy just to have a hookup with this guy that she kind of likes and I guess wants to be more and he's kind of stringing her along and she's, you know, peeing with the door open with her friends and, uh, hang, you know, instead of writing goes out to party with her friends for a little while. And then the tone really shifts. I think at the end, as you see her seems to be drugged, um, while out with these friends kind of falling out of her chair unexpectedly. Um, and then very, much out of it as she presents this book and, and the last pages of the book which seem to which she wrote while she's drugged are obviously come across very strange and not really making sense and then she, at the very end she has this flashback to uh some man either raping her having sex with her i think that's going to kind of be um one of the themes about this is like the idea of consent um and then she's just kind of like looking at the camera and you're kind of left with this idea of like, oh, this show totally flips here in these last like five ish minutes as you see her. It, it seems to be drugged and, and then have this experience, the sexual experience. And um, I'm really fascinated by it because I, I think Arabella as a character feels very engaging and also just like fun to be around, which I think they establish right off the bat really well. But then the surrounding characters also, I think, are, are pretty engaging. There's a lot of like, um, I think very interesting things that play like her, her best friend there. I think his name is Terry. Um, yeah, Terry played by Weruch Opia, who's uh, either like engaged or married, but seems to have the side chick and the fiance wants to have a threesome. I, I thought that was pretty funny. And then like seeing him and his friend, like give each other like looks while the two girls are like, talking to each other. I thought it was funny. Uh, I'm really interested to see Papa Esiidu, um, who plays her, uh, gay best friend who comes I, I forgot his name but comes to like visit her um, i thought he was really fun while he was there and just like he's doing a lot of acting with his face i thought it was great <laughs> so there's a lot of like ethics i'm really interested in but um, i think like you alluded to there's a lot of 
a lot to come. That is probably the, the main reason to stay tuned in. Any aspects that stood out to you or anything that you really liked about the first episode? I think the music stands out. It's kind of obvious thing. Tear whack drop, little Sims drop. Cole performs shuffle butter at karaoke while the night's still going well. Um, that's cool. That's choice. Again, another comp to insecure. Yeah. Uh, picking great but not mainstream songs. That's fun. Um, yeah. I, I, again, like I, I'm, I'm just really curious to see where this takes us because all, all the reviews have really followed a specific thing, and we really just get a taste of that at the end of the pilot. So, but it seems like it's going to be an interesting time. And I, I, you know, I want that. I, I'd rather something be challenging art when it comes to tackling really, really heavy stuff like um, sexual assault, Me Too, and whatnot. So that's good. And another uh, uh, co-production from HBO and the BBC, getting a lot of that. Um, Black Earth Rising is a co-production with Netflix. So Cole seems to really stick to her roots with that. That's cool. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very, very intrigued. Looking forward to this. We'll be talking about I May Destroy You in August when it wraps up, but Betty wrapped up its six-episode run in season one. We talked about Betty uh, after the first episode, and we were very engaged by the potential and also just like the overall vibe. Obviously, it's based off of the um, 2018 film Skate Kitchen, which Dave uh, I was a very big fan of. Was, I believe it was your number 10 movie of 2018. If I'm it was correct. up there, yes. Um, it's on Hulu now. Go watch. Do you do you feel like Betty, the now that you've seen the full season, lived up to its potential from the first episode? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. I think Betty's a... Uh, it's a lot of fun with a kind of wide-ranging cast of characters and while I, I would like more time with just about all these characters only six episodes three hours it's not it's not a whole lot of time to really get into some of these storylines that the characters have and i think that's probably a weak point but it was really good at that overall i think vibe it's going for and when you had the first episode with the Earl, all girl skate sesh doesn't really come together. Seems like it wasn't really promoted well by Kirk online. I'm not really sure, right? And I think that that is kind of a, a key thing with uh, Betty is that the passage of time, the transfer of information, character to character. A lot of times, it's like just not really of the mind. You just kind of ignore it, right? And it's kind of right. like a show about moments and scenes. Mm -hmm. But I did really appreciate wrapping that up full circle with the final episode and having that come together in such a good way because even though the show only touches on this just a little bit, uh, like when uh, Indigo is first starting to skate, uh, you know, the, the term Betty is, is kind of pejorative in skate culture. It's about, you know, it's like, it's kind of like, uh, like, like, uh, like, like a term like a roadie or something, right? Like, uh, like a groupie kind of term for, for, for girls hanging around skate, skate parks. And, um, the, the kind of coded misogynism that's a big that's been a part of skate culture at least uh you know past past 20 years uh we don't get a whole lot of that but i think it's still there and, and again wrapping that up with with the skate just coming together in such a big way at the end you get some really great moments and uh shots of them skating overall there's not a ton of skating in the middle parts of the season which i guess is a negative for me because all these girls are great skaters like they were yeah. skaters before they were actors right and i just like to see them just be bosses and do stuff, right? I guess Rachelle Vinberg probably does the most skating because of her uh, closeness to Bambi in the story. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, I liked it a lot. And I, there's no official season two renewal. I really hope uh, it does come back. It had modest ratings, but yeah, I, I do really, I did really enjoy it. Yeah. So you kind of alluded to it how the skating was obviously just a vehicle to bring these girls together and. Most of the storylines revolved around a lot of different, I think, very serious and, and important topics that teenagers are facing nowadays um, and, and dealing with. Which which of the storylines did you find worked and which ones were you maybe not as engaged with? Yeah, uh, I think I think uh, Camille's storyline with Bambi works well. Mm -hmm. Honestly, uh, it kind of ends with like, fuck that dude. Right? Yeah. Bambi sucks. Bambi sucks. Fuck Bambi. 
Um, <laughs> I like that. That was good. And I, the way they kind of wrap it up with all them shooting the shit on the sidewalk, just talking about it. And how she's like, no, no, we didn't fuck. I didn't do that. I don't know what his dick looks like. And like, they're just ragging on each other. That, that, that was really funny. Um, yeah. I like that. I think what didn't work for me as much was a Honey Bears storyline. Hmm. In terms of, uh, what was the girl? She was Ash. She? Ash. Katarina yeah. Tannenbaum. Right. And like, because you get it set up early on. I think she lives in Staten Island, I want to say, or Jersey. She's kind of away from the yep. lower west or east where they're chilling. Yeah. And she has this really strict conservative dad. So much to the point that she doesn't dress the way she actually dresses when she's around him, right? She doesn't, he doesn't like seem to know she even skates. And she, she, she brings up that fear or, or just uh, uncomfortability with her dad a few times in the season. Yet she still seems to have complete carte blanche and freedom uh, to do whatever she wants. And that's because, again, Betty, the show, doesn't focus on the minutia. So you don't actually know if this is coming back up for her time back at home or personal life there, because we're not seeing that. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, and like what would her and Ash, she, she like cuts it, breaks it off with Ash just because, and like, she's always like kind of like a really soft spoken person. And then mm-hmm. she's crying on the ferry afterwards. I was just kind of confused, like where, where her emotions were at. I thought that was kind of a little arbitrary to me. Um, and then she, what makes up with 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 the cool video saying i'm sorry i fucked up all right but yeah uh, <laughs> that that was one that was one of the weaker ones for me uh, i actually really, really liked honey bear um i i i think especially because she breaks up with ash after seeing her dad mm-hmm. in the terminal and it kind of like sparks in her mind like oh this actually isn't something i will actually work kind of thing and kind yeah. of freaks out it, it made a little bit more sense to me i think and i just found moon her name is moon bear which i think is yeah. fucking mm-hmm. awesome um I, I found her just to be a very uh actor i always wanted to watch i found her very like uh i don't know she's really caught my eye on the screen i i i, I found myself not really liking janae that much like that much out of the crew <clears throat> excuse me um, I didn't find myself liking Janae that much out of the crew, which I thought was interesting because that Dee Dee Lovelace, I think, seems to have some of the best acting chops. And I think mm-hmm. she got maybe the best like redemption arc in the end because she kind of hangs around with uh, Caleb Ebenhart's Donald, who's this real like fuck boy in this. Right. And like he seems like he's watching out for her at first, but then it kind of comes to light um, by her working through her issues with this person who is commenting on her YouTube page about Donald that Donald uh, sexually abused her. And I thought the way that she at the end was like, I'm not going to fix your problems. Like you got to do this on your own. You really like stood up and set that boundary. That was a great moment. But like her just like being mad at these girls for saying these things about Donald and like that being like gassed up by Kurt in that fight at the party. I felt like that didn't really work for me all the time. So I found myself a little bit, disengage with that well it just it just kind of felt like outdated thing that happened right like i feel like people of this age group are are in particular quite sensitive to those kinds of allegations and just to com- immediately attack the person bringing that up just kind of felt a little retrograde to me and maybe a little unrealistic mm-hmm. um maybe, maybe i'm wrong i'm not sure but um yeah, I, I still, I, again, I, I want to focus or just restate that. I think watch the film. The film has basically all these characters um, playing these same characters. And Camille has a really strong arc in the film Ski Kitchen. And it seemed like the show did not want to do the same kind of thing. I guess it's more about the vibes and then the overall group. And that's cool. Um, yeah, I mean, shout out to Jamie Reyes, Tony Hawk cameo at the end. That, yeah. that, that, that was. I thought it was actually really funny and awesome pull, to be yeah. honest, for the show. Totally agree. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's uh, also just a cool hang. You know, you're just kind of in in New York. And I think I made a comp before, but it's a lot like kids back in the day, except there's not like grievous drug use and, and sexual assault and stuff like in kids. But right. uh, kids is also about skating and that culture and people just kind of doing shit. And this is kind of a more uh, cleaned up version of that. So yeah. I think it's, it's kind of a cool legacy. 
I, I thought it was a great hang. Um, there were some really cool moments. Honestly, listening to cool songs and watching people skateboard is just always like fun. So mm-hmm. uh, if you got three hours and want to consume something different, I think this is a, not a bad way to waste some time. Um, and something that you can consume in about half the time that also is uh, a good use of your time, I think, is the new movie Shirley, um, directed by Josephine Decker. Um, I guess a uh, fictionalized account of Shirley Jackson, the famous horror suspense writer from the 40s and 50s, famously wrote, wrote The Haunting of Hill House, um, which I think I reviewed on this mm-hmm. podcast a couple of years ago. Um, starring uh, Shirley Jackson is played by Elizabeth Moss, who, I mean, at this point, who could ever doubt Elizabeth Moss's chops? This, this girl can act, and she acts her ass off in this movie. And, uh, I think there's a lot to dig into here, but I think I just want to start off by asking you, um, do you know what the F happened in this movie? <laughs> uh, that's funny. Yeah, I mean, going in, I didn't, so I haven't seen any of Josephine Decker's previous three films. This is her first mm-hmm. one. And then he kind of major backing. This is a neon film that's on Hulu now, would have had a theatrical release under different circumstances. And so I, I didn't realize that she's been tabbed as an experimental filmmaker before. But yeah, there's a lot of like dream sequency stuff and fantastical elements to the storytelling. Yeah. And the camera adds a lot to that in terms of stuff being fuzzy and the way it moves and stuff and claustrophobic and not. So it's not a traditional straightforward biopic, even if I guess the through line of what happens, quote unquote, is, I guess, pretty easy to comprehend once you understand it. But mm-hmm. yeah, so I, I thought that it was, uh, it was, it was cool to be a little more, uh, to have to, <laughs> have to pay more attention. Right. And just, and, right. And, and, and it reminds me a lot of, uh, her smell with Elizabeth Moss because it's another one of those unhinged character performances from Moss and it's she seems to be having a good time doing that in this case of course it's based off a book but um, yeah, yeah the, I think it's a good movie yeah I think her smell is probably the performance that most people are kind of referring back to with this and it, I mean it makes a lot of sense I think the difference is her smell she's so like outlandishly out there uh, whereas in this, it's it's like this like burning, uh, insanity, burning uh, ferocity right underneath the surface and all of it. You know, kind of mm. leading I think up to the the scene at the party where she like spills the wine onto the expensive couch as she uh, confronts her husband's lover um, at, at this party. But yeah, I, I asked the question about like what the F happened because I, I think the ending is very much like up to interpretation. And I, I think that why the ending works so well is because I think um, the the psychological thriller part of this is that this couple um, that comes to visit, uh, played by Odessa uh, yeah. Young and Logan Lerman, um, they really... I think are supposed to be like avatars in Shirley's mind for a lot of these things. Um, and, and whether they're real or not, I think they're probably real, but I think a lot of the things that you portray or that you see don't actually happen or are fictionalized by Shirley um, are supposed to be uh, like telling of her process her writing process. And by all accounts, Shirley Jackson that with her own mental health issues throughout her life, she died at a fairly young age, I believe like 47 or 48 from drinking, smoking, being overweight. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously a very troubled person. She dealt with a lot of anxiety, agoraphobia. So that's all I think p- portrayed pretty well in this movie. And I think um, I-, I like the fact that this is very like artsy in that sense that you kind of get to interpolate these scenes the way that you right. want to. Yeah, I mean, I think if you, if you don't know, like, Shirley Jackson history, and I, I, I didn't, I, I've read the lottery, the, sh- the short story, that's, that's it, though. Um, you understand that this is, this story is kind of leading up to her writing that, uh, one of her novels, I forget what it's called, with the H name, the Hang something. Hang, hang, and, hang a man. Sorry. Right. And that's, and the, the plot of that, that book is kind of based off of what's actually happening 
mm-hmm. with Odessa Young's character. So you can kind of, I could maybe, maybe you can predict more of, of the narrative if you're under aware of that history. I was mm-hmm. not before this. Um, I think Odessa Young and Logan Lorman, like you said, they are kind of our stand-ins, but I was not expecting to see Rose and Shirley develop kind of like a relationship of sorts. And there's allusions to some sexual tension later mm-hmm. on and the, the, the kind of the caregiver nature of it. Right. And it ends up being right. uh, the narrative ends up being more about like a, a comment on like, I guess, gender dynamics and, and mm-hmm. expectations at the time is taking place, I believe in the early fifties, right after the lottery yeah. was written. Um, and you know, that's, uh, again, I'm expecting you don't think it's going that uh, that way when you first start watching the film. Um, and yeah, I think ultimately, ultimately, it, it just th- those kind of dreamy sequences, those those weird vibes um, mm-hmm. that the camera helps sell. I think of scenes like when they're in the woods with the mushrooms and stuff. And it's not like a scene where they're going to do mushrooms and just fucking trip out of their balls. It's not actually about that at all, but it alludes to going that way. And it's just kind of like forging the bonds between those two characters. So uh, that's probably what I'm gonna take away from most. Um, yeah, I mean, Michael Michael Stahlberg plays Shirley's husband, Stanley Edgar Hyman, the, the critic, um, and he he actually ends up being quite a malevolent character once you understand what's going on a little bit more. So, yeah, I I, uh, I think I think it's quite a strong movie, and you know I haven't seen Decker's other films, but it definitely stands out for uh, kind of its artistic flourishes. Um, and also shout out uh, the filming of this. Uh, it's at Bennington College in Vermont for setting wise, but they actually filmed that at Vassar College, which is right in my hometown. So that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, you talked about the cinematography, which is done by Sterla Brandis uh, Grevian. And uh, the scene that really stands out to me with that like uh, dreaminess where you're almost like not sure if it's happening or not is when, um, sh- uh, sorry, not Shirley, Rose kind of finds the the book and surely kind of it tells her that yeah this is how they keep track of who's gonna sleep with the professor and all that and then it, you know Shirley kind of like walks away and goes and locks herself in the room and Rose kind of breaks in and just like the way that that shot just like I felt like I had no idea if that was actually happening at times or not it like spins around and like looks at Rose and then kind of cuts back to Shirley and then Shirley with with Stanley in the room. It's just very like surreal in a lot of senses. And uh, that like off kilterness, especially as the movie kind of goes further and further into, I think like the, the supposed to be madness of Shirley Jackson's mind and, and, and how she came to write these amazing stories. Um, I think it's just so perfectly paired like with the tone and, and this, the way it was shot. It was, Really, really a strong film, and I think Elizabeth Moss, depending on you know what what movies we all get to see this year and what gets nominated, <laughs> I think she might have an outside shot at maybe a, a nom. So uh, definitely one of the strongest actors of our time, uh, or at least right now. Um, anyways, I think that does it for us this week, Dave. Um, as we wrap up, what do we got for next week? The Five Bloods. Yeah, The Five Bloods. Spike Lee, Netflix. Very excited for that. Also have Von VOD, The King of Staten Island, that Judd Apatow directed Pete Davidson starring comedy, which is getting very strong reviews. Also on Disney Plus, Artemis Fowl. I don't think that'll be nearly as good. <laughs> and then we have a quartet of shows wrapping up. La TV, Insecure, What We Do in the Shadows. I know this much is true. Cough, not as excited about that one. And also Quiz, a three-part amc show at matthew mcfadden so a lot of cool stuff going on and also if you're interested i know selma and just mercy are free to rent right now yep. due to uh continuing conversations about our current climate so i think definitely watch Selma first but just mercy also has a lot to like and i think that discourse is kind of been interesting because we saw the help trend at the top 10 for netflix then we saw a lot of people saying hey don't watch that watch other stuff instead so uh, there's there's plenty plenty good stuff out there and it seems like the uh june will be good for new content and maybe late later on the summer is when stuff's gonna start drying up due to production 
delays, but yeah, we're good next week. A lot of stuff to talk about. I got a lot of TV to watch this week, so uh, <laughs> it'll it'll be busy. But uh, stay safe out there. Make your voice heard, and uh, we'll catch you on the flip side.